and proclaim your name to those we come in contact with. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. C.T. Studd says, some want to live within the sound of a church or a chapel bell. I want to run a rescue shop within a yard of hell. I think as Christians, it can get awfully comfortable to stay around here. And so we hear messages like, love your neighbor, which we're going to be talking about today. And this is our context of loving our neighbor, getting along with one another. But man, I want to stay comfortable. I want to stay within the confines of a church bell. I don't want to get so uncomfortable that I'm within a yard of hell rescuing people. But what we're going to see throughout today's message is that that is exactly what God wants us to do when it comes to loving our neighbors. And if you've been to the church any, any time length, you've heard messages about loving your neighbor. Some of you have heard it so often you could be up here giving the message. You know the different passages that speak on loving the neighbor. But I, I'm not too concerned with your knowledge this morning. I'm, I'm more concerned about how you've been doing with it. How have you been doing with loving your neighbor? Because not only are we talking about loving, but I opened the category last week about glory. And now glory is hard to define. We tried to do that a little bit last week because glory gets all, uh, all that God is, his presence and his nature is, is God's glory. And, and, and we can add to God's glory when we, when we do things and his nature. As fact, as Christians, we have an obligation to add to God's glory, just as Jesus did when he lived here on earth. He was glorifying his father and all the things that he did. In fact, even his death on the cross was to glorify his father. And so putting these two topics together, loving your neighbor and glorifying God, what does that look like? I want to use an illustration that might help us join these two together. And I was going to bring a mirror up here, but I was afraid if I just use a mirror to just shine the light in your eyes. So just imagine a mirror. And if I had a mirror and I pointed it at you, depending on how I angled that mirror, you'd be able to see the reflection of somebody else in the room, right? If I angle it real far, you'd be able to see someone over here like, I don't even know the right side of the church. I didn't know they came here. <laughs> if I angled it back, you'd see the people in the back. If I angled it up front, you'd be able to see the people up front. That's kind of how a mirror works, right? You see the reflection of, unless it's directed right back at you, you see yourself. But it, if it's on any sort of angle, you see someone else. And when we love our neighbors and we're pointed not at ourselves, but at God, they see God in us. Right? They see God in the mirror. And we have such a great opportunity to do that when we love. So what exactly is it that people see in the mirror when you love? When you treat your neighbor as yourself and you go and love them in some way. And it, it could be any, any way. There's some opportunities. Allison mentioned serve day out there. There's a lot of different opportunities to serve your neighbors. And we say serve day. It doesn't have to be on that exact day. That's just kind of to kick off our emphasis on service. And you might pick one of those opportunities. Maybe you have one yourself that you're already involved in and how you love. How, how are your neighbors seeing the reflection of God in you? What does that look like for them? What characteristics of God? There's several we're going to go through, but I want you to see this emphasis in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And the context of this passage is talking about the church, specifically how we use our gifts in the church, how we order ourselves in the church, how our services are to look like. And 1 Corinthians 13, I feel like Paul takes this pause to remind us of how important love is. Verses 1 through 3 say, If I speak in tongues, tongues of men, or, or if I speak in tongues of angels, but I do not have love. Well, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I, if I have the gift of prophecy and I can fathom all mysteries, all knowledge, and I, if, I've, if I have faith that could move a mountain, but I don't have love, I'm nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor, if I give over my body, if I'm, if I'm martyred for the faith, I'm killed for Jesus, that I might boast, but I don't have love, I gain nothing. So you see how important love is in this equation of serving others. This is how important it is in, in 
living out our faith in the church. Imagine how much more important it is living our faith out in the world to those that aren't here in our gathering. I mean, love is indispensable. Without it, according to this passage, you have nothing. You're a resounding gong. Even if your faith can move mountains, even if you're martyred and killed for your faith, if you don't have love, it's nothing. And so love is this mirror that people get to see God in very clearly. So what are some of the characteristics that they see of God when you are willing to serve and love your neighbors? And so we're just going to go through a few this morning. There's a whole lot of others that we could go through. We just don't have the time for this morning. And I don't have this, these in any particular order. We're going to go through a lot of different scriptures as we look at this. Here's the first one. Loving our neighbors shows God's goodness. Loving our neighbors shows God's goodness. There's a lot of people in our culture, in the world around us, that have a preconceived idea of what God is. God is judgmental. God is ready to condemn me. God just has a lot of rules to follow. And so for you to step into a space where you can love your neighbor and say, no, 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 God is good. How do I know that? Because I've experienced that. And I'm, I'm demonstrating that goodness to you as I serve and I love you. Someone pointed this out to me last week because we talked about Moses and how Moses saw the glory of God. As we were trying to define glory last week, I used the illustration of like a bucket, right? God's presence and nature. All these things about God are filling up this bucket of who he is. And Moses asked this question in the Old Testament to God, God, let me see your glory. And God's like, I don't know, because you're, the, things are going to get a little crazy. I don't know if you can handle it. And Moses just flat out says in chapter 33, verse 18, now show me your glory. And then this is the Lord's response. And I didn't catch this before, but it's so perfect. It's so good. It's, it's so true. The Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you. This is the equation that God has with his glory. His glory equals goodness. And so he says, I'll I'll cause them all my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. And so God allows this to happen, and Moses is kind of hidden in this cleft of the rock as he sees the glory go by, and his his face is forever changed. Do you remember we talked about this last week? People said, put a veil over your face. You're like glowing because Moses saw the glory of God, the goodness of God. And you and I have an opportunity to reflect that goodness when we love God. Our neighbors, when we love the people around us, they realize, oh, God is a good God. Psalm 34, verse 8. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Taste and see that the Lord is good. How how can people taste and see that the Lord is good? Most people I know that have come to faith in Jesus did not come to that faith because they were persuaded by some random argument online. It's probably happened, but it's not the vast majority of the cases. More than the majority of the time, people are not converted into Christianity because of a TikTok video that they saw. It's happened, I'm sure, but, but the majority of the people that I know that have come to know who Jesus is, it's because someone told them. They had a personal relationship. They were able to taste and see that the Lord is good because someone allowed them to see God in love, right? Maybe it was a parent for you or a grandparent for you. Maybe it was a neighbor. It was someone that invited you to church and they said, hey, come and taste a little bit. Come and see what we're doing. Come, come, come to know who Jesus really is. I know you might have some preconceived, just, just come and check us out. Check out Jesus. Come and see that the Lord is good. You have an opportunity to do that when you love your neighbor. Here's the second thing. Loving our neighbors shows God's heart for the lost. Loving our neighbors shows God's heart for the lost. God has a heart for those that are far from him, and he wants them to see who he truly is, and he he chases after them. He runs after them. He pursues them. I mean, since the beginning of scripture all the way back in the, in the first book, Genesis, we see God pursuing this relationship that was broken with sin. And he gives a promise. One day there's going to be an offspring of Eve that will crush the head of Satan. And God continues to pursue that relationship. 
Jesus tells a story about this. Jesus is found in a place that really isn't surprising to us because we've, we've seen Jesus like this before. But for those that were living with Jesus, they were surprised to find him at the house of a tax collector and with sinners and eating with them. And they didn't think Jesus should be there. And in response, Jesus tells a story in Luke 15, verse 3. He tells them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and he goes home. He calls his friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me. I've found my lost sheep. I tell you that not that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Do you see God's heart in Jesus' story here? God's heart for the lost, for those that are far from him, for his pursuit into those that he knows needs a relationship. He knows they need hope. He knows they need something more in life. He knows they need a new creation. It's in his power that all of that could come. If only someone would go and shine his glory, be that reflection in the mirror of him to these people. And so loving your neighbor shows God's heart for the lost. 2 Corinthians 5 gets at this a little bit as well. And it's this command for you and I to to understand or to get others to understand the connection they can now have with God. It's called reconciliation. That this relationship that was broken all the way back in Genesis between humans and God can be reconciled. There's now a possibility for us to have a relationship with God. Before, yes, Old Testament was all about rules and law and structure, but now there's an opportunity for a relationship because of what Jesus did. And so Paul in writing 2 Corinthians is making this case. And in chapter 5, uh, verse 13, he says things like this. If, if we are out of our mind, as some say, it is for God. If, if we're out of our mind, it's for God, right? Everything's for God's glory. So you think I'm crazy? Even that would be for God as we talk about this relationship we can have with God. Verse 14 says, for Christ's love compels us. This is, this is the reason behind all of this. This is why I'm tilting my mirror towards God, not at myself, but at God, because it's because of Jesus. And then verse 16 through 21, there I want to read to you. It says, so from now on, because of all of this, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. My neighbor is not just my neighbor. My neighbor is something more than that. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. And all of this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us now the ministry of reconciliation. See that as Christians, we now have that same ministry of reconciliation, of bringing people to God because of what Jesus did. Verse 19, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. We go on his behalf. As though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. You see, the important ministry we have as Christians to be these ambassadors, these ministers of reconciliation, to bring the news of this relationship, the possibility of this relationship to those that haven't received it yet. Those that are lost, those that don't understand. This is God's heart for the lost. And continuing on, number three, the third thing that we do as we reflect God's love to our neighbors is that we show God's grace and mercy. We show God's grace and mercy when we love our neighbors. And now we get to the story maybe you're very familiar with, a story of the, the Good Samaritan. And we'll get to this story again in this sermon series. But the Good Samaritan, is Jesus is telling a story to a, um, essentially a lawyer, someone that's very familiar with the law, and he's called an expert in the law, like he's got things down. He likes details, right? 
And so he comes and asks Jesus, Jesus, what's the most important law? Like if we had to boil things down and Jesus wanting to engage the man says, well, what do you think it is? And he says, well, I think love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and, and love others. And Jesus likes, likes that. He says, I, I think that's good. And the man wants some details. And he says, okay, but who's my neighbor? Like, like what, what's my obligation in this love thing? Is, is my neighbor defined by the address of the person next to me? Is my love and my neighbor defined by the people that look like me, my, like my little group that I have? Is, is neighbor defined by some other cri- cri- criteria? What's my obligation, Jesus? And so to engage him even further, he tells a story. Then it's of this man that gets robbed and stripped of his clothing and left for dead on the side of the road. And a priest, an upstanding man in society, walks by and Jesus says, what does the priest do? But walk to the other side of the road so that he doesn't have to walk past the man and he goes on his day. And another person, a Levite, would go down that same road and saw the man on the, the side and same thing, crossed the road and continued on his day. But a Samaritan, now this is where you boo in the story. Boo. Yeah, okay. The Samaritans were not looked upon favorably, and we're not going to get into all the details for that, but this is not the hero of any story. It's like, it's like in video games, Russia is always the bad guy, right? This is like the Russia of the, the first century here. Like Everybody can, can look down upon the Samaritans and, and who they are as people. And so Jesus says, okay, the Samaritan comes, and these people expecting the same thing in the story, like, okay, he's going to cross the road and go on. No, 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 but this Samaritan stops. He bandages the man. He puts him on his donkey. He goes to the inn so that he can take care of him. And he, he stays with the man that night. And then he gives him extra money, the, the innkeeper extra money, and says, okay, take care of him. And if that's not enough, I'll come back and I'll pay you whatever I owe you. And at the end of the story, Jesus asks this in verse 36 of Luke 10. Which of these three, the priest, the Levite, the Samaritan, do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell in the hands of the robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus told him, go and do likewise. So what were the criteria for loving your neighbor? Who, who's your neighbor? Was Jesus' criteria the person that has the address next to you? No. Was the criteria of the neighbor uh, someone that's kind of in the same socioeconomic class as you and and would clearly be your friend in a given circumstance? No. Was neighbor defined as someone with the same sexual orientation as you? No. Was neighbor defined as someone the same skin color as you? No. The neighbor is someone that you come upon that you know is in need. And they may be very different than you. They may look down upon you in many different ways. But you're still called to love. Why? Because your demonstration here in the the man's answer to show God's mercy. To show God's mercy. I always think about mercy because uh, when I was younger, I was beat up by my brother a lot. And he somehow convinced me to play this game where you kind of hold hands a little bit and then you like, you really try to hurt each other, right? And if you're losing, you say mercy. And if you say mercy, they'll finally stop beating you up, right? Like somehow this is a game. I don't know. And so mercy is, is, is something like, so I, I was losing that game. I deserve, I guess, to get hurt in that game. And mercy is like, okay, I won't give you what you deserve. And here, scripturally, God doesn't give us what we deserve when we come to know who Jesus is. We're set on a path for hell based on our own sins and our own decisions in life and our own choices. And mercy is God saying, no, no, no. I'm going to forgive that because of my son. And I'm going to have grace on you. Grace is is something we we don't deserve, unmerited favor. We, We don't get this gift of eternal life because of something we did. We give it because God is a good God. And that brings us to the next thing that we display when we shine the mirror of love and service towards our neighbor is forgiveness. When we love our neighbors, we show God's 
forgiveness. This is part of the grace and mercy that continues to extend upon us through us to others, and we also show them God's forgiveness. And forgiveness is not natural, right? Forgiveness is hard. And so when people see it, their ears perk up. They understand and see God's goodness. First John chapter 2, verse 12 says, I'm writing to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name, because of the name of King Jesus, which we sang about earlier. Because of his great name, your sins have been forgiven to give him more glory. And so when you forgive others, you also give that same glory to God. You add to that bucket of glory. Colossians 3.13, something very similar. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Then later on in verse 17, it's a reminder. Again, we do this in the name of Jesus. It's for God's glory, for Jesus's glory that we forgive. That's, that's not, I mean, for, it wasn't for us to forgive. It's because God wants us to forgive that we do. Now, forgiving does help us too. That's God's goodness. God does command us to do things that are beneficial for us. And forgiveness is, we need to remind ourselves because it's not natural for us to forgive. Now, forgive and forget are two different things. Forgive essentially is that I, don't, I won't use that against them anymore. I won't use that, heart, that harm or that destruction on our relationship to further destroy them or to further harm them. I'm going to release that. Now, I may remember it. I may set up boundaries in my life so it doesn't happen again. But I'm going to learn to forgive. St. Augustine says resentment is like taking poison and hoping the other person dies. And so what happens when you hold on to that resentment, saying, I'll never forgive that person? We saw in a huge way about 10 years ago, there was a white supremacist, Dylan Roof. He walked into the Mother Emanuel AME Church in, in uh, Charleston, South Carolina, and gunned down a small gathering of people in a church that were gathering for Bible study that morning. Ended up killing nine people in that church the atrocity of the situation, um, had the, the nation talking about it and what happened and uh, the reasons behind it. And one long-term member of the Mother Emanuel Church was able to express forgiveness amongst the discussion and topic in our nation. And it was happening and it, it influenced a lot of people. And this is, this is one quote uh, from that longtime member. It says, it took me a while to forgive. If somebody shot my mother, I don't think I could have be forgiving, but now I realize I could. I just felt like I've been praying, forgive those who trespass against us from the Lord's Prayer for years. And now it's time to re-examine those words and practice it. That's forgiveness. The forgiveness that's demonstrated when we love someone that's done us harm and we're still willing to love them and forgive them. We shine our mirror on that glory of God so they see God in us. Not us, but God. Continuing on, loving our neighbor shows God's holiness. It shows God's holiness. This is an interesting one. And one reason why I ended with this, because I think a lot of it's culminating here in, in God's holiness. When we hear the word holy, what are some other words that come to your mind? A consecrated, set apart, sacred. Oftentimes when we think of holy, we think of, of not having to do with anything else in the world, like, like holy for God. Holy for God does mean to live within the sound of a church bell, and I need to surround myself just with godly things and push everything else out. But that's not what we see in the life of Jesus. And that fact that there's, there's something more happening in this word holy and how God demonstrates it with, with yes, being set apart, but also but also being intimately involved. Being set apart, but intimately evolved. Let me show you this in John 13, 34 and 35. Jesus says, a new command I give you. Love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So Jesus is saying, look, our love needs to look like his love. In fact, by that love, everyone will know that we are disciples. And then I want us to flip over to 1 Thessalonians 3. 
First Thessalonians chapter 3 is a letter to a church that Paul uh, writes and with, with some others to this early, this church that was just starting. And he, he's trying to get them to understand, look, you need to be holy. You need to be different than others around you. But by, the, by being different, or by the act of trying to be different, the way you're going to get there is by loving even more deeply, by being intimately involved with other people. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 12 and 13, it says this, May the Lord make your love increase. May the Lord make your, make your love increase and overflow for each other, for everyone else, just as ours does for you. May he strengthen your hearts. Why? So that you may be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus Christ comes with the holy ones. In other words, the way to make yourself more holy is not by pushing everybody else away, but it's actually by loving more and loving deeply and loving others that God has put in your path to love. All right, let's sum it up with this last one. Loving our neighbors brings glory to God. That's what we've been talking about this whole time. Loving others brings glory to God. It's it's our final statement for this morning that loving others brings glory to God. That's, that's our whole reason behind it. And really our command as Christians, and, and we could have just said that from the beginning and been done. But I think when we see all the things that God can do with our love, it gives us motivation to love a little bit more than maybe we currently are. Because our love doesn't end with that person. We talked about this last week. Our love would just be a worldly love if it ended with that person. But that love is involved in God's glory and God is able to do something with it that becomes even more than anything we could have done in, our, in ourselves. And it does something to that person that we, more than we could have ever done in ourselves. And so our love for others needs to be displayed so that we can bring glory to God. Last verse, Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, it says this, in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So you love others so they can see your good deeds. Not so you can be glorified, not so they say, man, you're such a great person. I really appreciate you doing that. When the, you go out on that serve project that you signed up for and you go out that Saturday to serve and they go, man, that was so great. I so appreciate you. They go, man, this is not me. It's not to glorify me. It's not so I feel better. I check the box to say, yep, I got my serving for the year. Everything is good. The reason is to glorify God, to bring him glory, to bring him praise. So people see him in you. And you say, man, it's not about me. In fact, I'd much rather have slept in on this Saturday. In fact, if I just followed my own heart, it would be to do something I want to do or just to be with my family more or just to do this activity I've been waiting to do or just check that list, another thing off the list of things I have to do at home. But God's put this, you know what? God's put this thing in my heart that just, that calls me to serve him and, and, and he calls me to serve others as I serve him. So that's why I did it today. And they see God's glory in that. You may have heard of... Um, the 23andMe family genealogy test where you like, they get a swab in, in your mouth, you send it off, they do your DNA test and they'll tell you like, you know, your ancestry. It's an ancestry test, right? And uh, the CEO was talking about uh, some of the other things they do with this test and they give you, um, they, they think their test is different because they give you what you might, some diseases you might have later on in life, right? Which is kind of scary to know some of that stuff. And so they, they say, hey, do you want to opt into uh, this health section of uh, this database we have? Like you, we, we can tell you if, if uh, you may have heart disease later in life. We'll tell you if you might have prediabetes. We, we'll tell you all these things that might, uh, you might be predisposed to in life. And so then the CEO was asked, okay, well, how do you know if people are really doing anything with that information? Like, is that information helpful for people to know? And she says, well, there's, we give surveys to people. And they said 40% of people that self-report say they want to do something with that information, which is ridiculous. Because people are told, hey, you're pre-diabetic. And only 40% of people are saying, well, I, I, I'll do something with that, right? 
The other 60% are like, eh, I'm good, that's fine. <laughs> so only 40% of people are, are really care about something that might hap- happen future-wise, right? They're like, I'll deal with it when it happens. And that scares me when it comes to loving our neighbor. Because we don't love our neighbor for our health. We love our, our neighbor because it might mean eternal life for them. And if 40% of us are only going to do some action based on our own health and something that might cause us to die later in life, how much few of us are willing to do something that maybe just doesn't seem as tangible? So come back to what I talked about at the beginning. It's not just more knowledge about loving our neighbor. It's more action about loving our neighbor. And the serve day is one opportunity to do that in a few weeks. But man, what about today? What about tomorrow? What about next week when it comes to loving your neighbor so that God is glorified? We're going to sing this song. If, if you have anything that's going on in your heart this morning that you need prayer for, we have members of our prayer team that'll be over at the prayer cove. They would love to pray for you during this song. After the song, after service, they'll be over there. Just another way to be encouraged as a church body. We want to go out. And we want to go out as, as an army ready to love others. And sometimes we just need to be built up in prayer. And so that's one opportunity for us. But why don't you join with me as we stand and sing this next song together as another act of encouragement.